a very specific example of the challenges and choices in the energy sector. Over to you, Phil. Thank you very much. I'm just going to, I think I'm sharing the screen, so just give me a sec. Um, oh, no, it's there. Oh, it's gone again. Okay. <laughs> Hang on. Oh, good. Okay. Um, thanks, Vanessa. And um, hi there. Uh, I'm Phil, uh, research fellow at the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex. And I'm going to be talking about some research that I've been doing uh, for a few years now with uh, Andy Sterling, also at SPRU. And I'm afraid in the interest of time, I'm going to have to speak in quite a, a stark fashion, uh, unlike the usual nuanced academic discussion, but we've got papers uh, if you want the more nuanced academic discussion, but it boils down to two core points, I think. And the first is that um, a key driver that lies behind the UK's commitment to a lot of civil nuclear power is the need to sustain the skills, capabilities and supply chains that the UK needs uh, to construct military nuclear activity, in particular nuclear power submarines. In a sense, civil energy will be cross-subsidizing military nuclear activity, and this sort of relates to two of the key things that SGR look at in terms of uh, military issues and, of course, energy, and this brings the two together. And the, the second point is that despite considerable evidence that this is what's going on, uh, the issue is barely discussed in the UK. And this is a democratic issue. Um, next slide. So, uh, and keep going because there's a few bullets. So, uh, thanks. Uh, so basically, um, this is a, a correlation of who is building uh, lots of new nuclear power, uh, intense nuclear new build over 6,000 uh, megawatts uh, from the World Nuclear Association uh, data. And to boil down a complex picture, it's clear that um, those that are building a lot of nuclear power tend to be nuclear weapon states. Um, and global military powers are the most committed to large scale nuclear new build. Indeed, there is no global or regional military power that does not hold an active history of very strong pressures for civil nuclear power. And indeed, no country with or planning nuclear weapons or submarines is pursuing a nuclear moratorium or phase out. So the broad international picture does certainly point to patterns of the overlap between uh, ambitions around civil nuclear and commitments to nuclear weapons infrastructures. Next slide. And let's boil down to the UK case. And this is what we've been looking at in detail. The basic point is if you look at the energy policy debate, there's virtually nothing on this. So since the very long and drawn out nuclear renaissance began um, instigated by Tony Blair in 2006. At no point in time really has there been a, any part of the debate that actually this, there may be a military related dimension to this. However, all you need to do is look at military documents, which is what we did. And it's very clear that in military debates that uh, nuclear submarine uh, capabilities um, heavily depend on civil nuclear uh, programs. And indeed, they point out that the UK is without the financial or personnel resources to develop both programs in isolation. Uh, they also point out, next bullet point, please keep going. <laughs> Redacted uh, MOD reports uh, highlight that the submarine industry is at the bare minimum uh, necessary to deliver the program. And it's pointed out that the solution to these challenges is to mask military costs behind civil, civil nuclear programs. As I say, however, uh, this is almost entirely hidden in energy debates and indeed media coverage in the UK. Yet there's some clues. Uh, for example, the National Audit Office report on Hinkley C highlights that given the extremely high costs of nuclear, the facts that renewables are clearly cheaper and the government's own figures show this, uh, and considering the delays that have occurred, there really is something beyond energy that's going on that they call strategic factors, but they don't say what these are. We think these are military-related factors. 
And indeed, the, the costs are quite significant. So if you look at the lifetime of Hinkley C, 35 years, three times, um, uh, or sorry, currently double the cost of electricity, and that's only going to increase, you're going to have tens of billions of pounds potentially transferred uh, from civil to military supply chains. And based on evidence that we submitted to the PAC, um, Stephen Lovegrove, um, who is the permanent secretary of the MOD, for the first time on record, did concede that yes, these civil military links are there and you need concerted government action to facilitate um, these links. There's one more bullet, yeah. And Energy Minister Richard Harrington in the same year, despite the narrative that the civil military are separate, he said that actually this is an artificial distinction that must come to an end. This all happened around 2017. Next slide. And it's quite clear, we did manage to get a BBC News uh, story on this about the, uh, the links between civil nuclear and the submarine supply chains. Um, but the issue uh, continues to be almost entirely undiscussed in Westminster. And it's very odd because, uh, for example, if you look at Rolls-Royce, um, in their documentation around small modular reactors, which there's hype around now, uh, they're very clear. And they say that the, this small modular reactor program has great advantages for the deterrent program. It can assist with skills and expertise and Importantly, it can alleviate the burden on the MOD to support some of the skills and the infrastructures associated with military nuclear, in other words, saving costs. But the democratic issue comes in. This is not discussed in Westminster, as I say. It is in Scotland, interestingly. We managed to get a parliamentary motion that um, said that our evidence goes some way in explaining the otherwise inexplicable commitment to new nuclear, but not in Westminster. Next slide. And this is the democratic challenge. And, uh, you know, in the, it, at the moment, there is almost not a day that goes by where we do not have another article about the hype of the next nuclear thing. So it's Sizewell C yesterday uh, for the building back better. Boris wants to plow ahead with Sizewell C which I think is, is not a good idea, or it's the mini nuclear reactors are going to power the North. Uh, Dominic Cummings is very keen on these. If you want to actually look at the, get the evidence about the submarine linkages and the military factors, often you'll encounter documents like this on the military side. And this was only obtained by journalist Rob Edwards and others from a freedom of information request in 2014, huge redacted things, but there's little morsels of information that say, the submarine sector needs to engage more with the civil sector and all these kind of things. But it remains in almost entirely undiscussed in coverage when you get reports about small modular reactors. Next slide. And one of the key things that we hear about Sizewell C and other developments is it's about jobs, jobs, jobs. This is the, what the BBC coverage was saying recently that we, okay, nuclear is expensive, yes, and uh, it's very slow and all these kind of things, but we need it because of the jobs. But where are the nuclear jobs in the UK? Well, if you look at the Nuclear Industry Council reports and so on, I mean, almost 40,000 of these jobs are defence jobs. And the demand for highly skilled nuclear personnel is in defence. And you can see that the actual jobs supplied for construction are quite short term, uh, but they do have a lot of investment. IEA and so on are very clear about where the low carbon jobs of the future are coming from and not many are coming from nuclear but for some reason the UK really emphasizes the importance of nuclear jobs and just below it's quite small but these are you know we all know this these are the cost resource curves of the onshore and offshore wind for the UK we have the best renewables resource in uh, Europe for renewables. If there's any country that should be going for an 100% renewable strategy, it should be the UK. Yet this isn't considered as a legitimate avenue uh, to pursue. Next slide. Um, so this is actually the final slide where I want to wrap it up. And, you know, I really don't see any, any longer that there is 
a technological argument that 100% renewables is not as achievable as an energy system with nuclear. There's hundreds of peer reviewed articles doing detailed modeling, assessing this. Um, Spain, just last week, committed to such a strategy for 2050. Uh, I do believe that if we're talking about 2030, renewables are a more rapid and cost effective means of decarbonizing. And let's simply look at the UK nuclear renaissance. And this is another point that I don't understand why it isn't discussed. You know, the commitment was that there would be significant amounts of low carbon uh, nuclear significantly before 2025. Or the lights would go out and uh, we would miss our climate target. Instead, renewables have delivered and nuclear hasn't. But this very simple point doesn't seem to be addressed. I'd say that renewables pathways offer a greater number of uh, more geographically distributed employment opportunities. But the fundamental thing here that we need to change about the UK discourse, and we have a responsibility to challenge, whether pro or anti-nuclear, is that there is a choice. The, the discourse in the UK is very much presented as we must have nuclear, but it, it's, it's simply not the case. There is a choice. And I think we have responsibilities to address the military implications of certain energy trajectories. Not only could renewables pathways offer a faster route and a cheaper route to decarbonization, more geographically distributed jobs, it also offers the potential for something else, which is the chance for more peaceful uh, energy systems of the future. Um, and in a functioning democracy, we need to discuss, discuss these issues. And I'm ju I've just got the Amory Lovins book there, Soft Energy Paths, because I feel in many ways, the discourse around energy futures has become very narrowed. One of the most fundamental issues used to be about demilitarizing energy systems and about creating peaceful futures. And that's been a bit lost in very technocratic debates that we have now. So if we do acknowledge we have a choice of what zero carbon future to have, then the question of uh, how an energy system can create peace and demilitarized futures uh, should be central. And with that, I think that's me. Phil, thank you so much. Um, as, as has been said before, um, 